Okay, uh, good um, <clears throat> morning, everybody. Um, Bill Offerman, I'll be talking to you today about uh, statistics and uh, research. And uh, um, looks like I think most people probably, you know, hopefully logged on now. It's a few minutes after 11.30, so we're going to get started. Um, so yeah, if, uh, any questions along the way, please feel free to, uh, you know, ask or text. And if that gets a little bit too busy, we'll just, uh, you know, I'll let you know. We'll uh, keep questions till the end. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about an introduction to uh, probability and statistics for diagnostic testing and research. Um, our uh, webinar series is supported uh, by, as part of the uh, RRA RAZOR online statistical training for radiology researchers, and we are supported by a venture fund grant from the AUR r &E Foundation. Okay, our learning objectives are basically we're going to talk up. This is a talk is to provide a broad overview of some of the uh, statistical uh, techniques and concepts needed for not just for performing research, but also to have an understanding of research and how to evaluate research uh, critically. So when I'm um, thinking of probability and statistics, I like to think of it as basically two sides of the same coin. Probability assumes that you know the underlying physical principles and processes at work, um, and that from this you can estimate um, the uh, probability of certain events occurring. Statistics is the flip side of that, where you've got a data set and you either uh, don't know or you have some hypotheses about how, about the nature of the process that's, uh, you know, governing the data, like the, you know, the uh, probabilistic framework that your data obeys, and you're trying to either um, make some inferential statements about, you know, the process occurring uh, and model your data. Okay, so you're basically seeing like how well the data corresponds to your model or trying to, you know, at, uh, make some uh, um, statements regarding what that model is. So we'll start out, I think that to really um, uh, get a grasp of probability and statistics is very helpful to understand what hypotheses are. Now this is useful not just from um, the performing research and also critically appraising research. Hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a phenomenon. A key aspect of diagnostic testing and statistics is formulation of a good hypothesis. Um, so hypotheses are often paired with their logical opposite. Um, the null hypothesis is often considered the default hypothesis, and when doing research, it is often the hypothesis that nothing happened. Uh, and the alternative is basically the opposite, which would basically mean that something happened. Now, to show you, um, so an example of that would be um, that, uh, let's say that you uh, give a, um, a certain medication to a patient, the null hypothesis would be that, you know, the medication had no effect. The alternative would be the medication did have an effect, for example. Hypotheses should address the question of interest and be testable. Now, the be testable part is very key um, because very often, you know, one has a question you're looking to answer, but the hypothesis may or may not be phrased in a way that is readily uh, testable um, with the data available. And so a clear statement of a hypothesis is critical for appropriate statistical testing. Um, and so having a good hypothesis is crucial for performing high quality research. And I personally think it's a very good idea to construct a good testable hypothesis before beginning a research project. So before you even start collecting your data, I think it's a very good idea to a state, you know, have a very, very, very clear statement of what your hypothesis is. Now, I rec you know, recognize that you know, as one does research, things don't go as planned. You know, very often they don't go as planned, possibly more often than not. Um, and uh, realize that hypothesis might change, and it's actually helpful to reevaluate the hypothesis to make sure that you're actually asking you know, the question that you know, really uh, pertains to what the information you want to know and that the data you've gathered doesn't make another question more important. So shown here, are what I would consider two poorly constructed hypotheses. Um, so for example, um, the medication decreases blood pressure and the radio tracer detects cancer. Um, so I would basically say that these hypotheses are vague and very difficult to explicitly test. One can test them, but, but in doing so, one would have to you know, basically refine these hypotheses further before they become um, immediately testable. And so I'll give you a few examples of um, some of those in a moment here. 
So let's consider this when the medication decreases blood pressure. How can we possibly reword this so that it's, it's more testable? Well, this might be a way of making that hypothesis more testable. Your null hypothesis would be that the mean blood pressure in the treatment group is equal to the mean blood pressure in the control group. Um, or that is that there is no effect of the treatment that's given to the subject. Whereas the alternative would be that the mean blood pressure in the treatment group is lower than the mean blood pressure in the control group. So this is definitely more testable, but I would argue that you can even take it further than this, or should take it further than this prior to conducting and starting a research project, because this doesn't exactly tell you how one will compute the hypothesis, well, one will compute the statistics needed to test this hypothesis and let you know, or uh, really show you what data is needed. I would argue that you'd want to refine this further and say exactly what mean blood pressure refers to. Now, there are a few ways of calculating mean blood pressure. One metric that is often used is that uh, setting mean blood pressure equal to one-third the systolic blood pressure plus two-thirds the diastolic blood pressure. Now, I, I think this is very important because in phrasing the hypothesis this way, not only you know, do you know how you're going to calculate it, but you also know the data needed, the data you need to acquire in order to test it. So, for example, if one was recording blood pressures, um, you know, it could be that you, know, you might just actually not record, you might only record the systolic and not the diastolic. Then you go down to actually crunch the numbers to, run, you know, to see whether or not you've, uh, your, your data is significant. You realize, oh my god, we didn't collect all the data we need. Now, this is a more straightforward example, and I doubt this would occur, but I've seen this happen when people do uh, statistics on, on, on data sets they've collected that they realize when it comes time to test their hypothesis that they haven't collected all the data they need to really you know, test the statistics they want to test, and then they need to go back and look at their data again or collect more data, and you really don't want to do that. Um, this is a great example of why you know, really having a well-stated um, hypothesis in advance, you know, stating exactly how you're going to compute your test statistic is important to be able to make sure that you've got a testable hypothesis and you collect all the data you need in advance. Another example here, we have this radio tracer detects cancer. Better way to state it that the radio tracer is not able to detect cancers larger than five millimeters and is able to detect cancers larger than five millimeters. Here you've explicitly stated you know, what your size threshold is for detection. Um, but I, I would argue an even better way of stating this is that since remember that, you know, just detection is kind of, it's really dependent on the threshold you set, okay? And um, so, you know, like what does it actually mean to be able to detect something? Well, you could actually refine this further and specify in advance what sensitivity and specificity you would like to achieve for this radio tracer. Um, now, once again, having a well-formulated specific hypothesis like this in advance will really help guide one such that they can construct their uh, test and experiment appropriately and collect all the data they need before they gather data, because very often it's difficult, if not impossible, to be able to get the data you need um, after the experiment or study's already been done. In a retrospective study, while this is possible, it's, it's irritating to have to reanalyze your data a second time. But for an actual experiment, when you're working with human subjects, this may not even be feasible. Um, and so I really believe that formulating a good hypothesis before the beginning of a research project helps ensure that all the data um, that's needed is collected. And likewise, when evaluating um, papers in the literature, um, I really think that one should always look and find out what hypothesis they're trying to test, because what often I've found is that the hypothesis that is stated um, you know, either in the uh, introduction or in the abstract, is, is often different from the hypothesis they're testing. Um, and so to really assess research and make sure it's high quality research, the hypothesis um, that's being tested should match the one that's stated and uh, be, corresponds to the results that are presented. So now we'll talk a little bit about probability. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, probability refers to the likelihood of a particular event occurring. Now this assumes that we know the laws of the process, uh, uh, laws governing the process that we're examining. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the example of a fair coin, which I will use here. So a fair coin is basically a coin where the probability of receiving a heads or a tails are both 50%. Uh, there is a 0% probability of the coin landing on its edge. And using this known behavior, you can estimate the probability of flipping a coin and you know, obtaining the results, you know, heads, heads, tails, heads. <clears throat> 
Um, and so when uh, doing diagnostic testing, it is important to know that um, the, uh, the, there's uh, the probabilities we're looking at. There, there are several probabilities involved. There's often the probability of uh, an event occurring, like the pretest probability, um, the probability of obtaining certain uh, test results, and how that combines to form the post-test probability. Now, um, the post-test probability is often defined as being the product of the pretest probability and the likelihood ratio where the likelihood ratio basically gives the, uh, the probability of event occurring given the results of a test. Now, I think it's very important to understand this when evaluating um, the results of, uh, you know, uh, looking at the literature, because um, in the literature when uh, many uh, radiology papers and uh, research is presented, it's often in an effort to um, refine one's ability to make uh, diagnostic decisions. So they were trying to improve on tests used for refining the probability of a disease. And so it's very important to understand pre-post-test probabilities. And shown here is a diagram that many of you have maybe already seen. It's called a Fagan normogram. And it basically shows a relationship of how the post-test probability shown on the right um, relates to the pre-test probability shown on the left via the likelihood ratio. So given a certain pre-test probability and likelihood ratio for the test, one, can ha one will have an estimate of the post-test probability. Um, so shown here, if one has, let's say, a 50% pretest probability, and I'm a thoracic radiologist, so I'll be talking a little bit about um, uh, VQ studies for pulmonary embolism. So let's say that the pretest probability of a pulmonary embolism is 50%. Um, if one were to conduct a test with a likelihood ratio of 0 0.2, the post-test probability would be 2%, so very low. Similarly, if one had a pretest probability of uh, 50%, but a likelihood ratio of 20. So, um, so you'll see basically about a uh, 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 substantially larger uh, than the um, a prior example. You'll notice you have a post-test probability of 95%. And so, the reason I showed that example is diagnostic testing is most often most useful in cases where there's an intermediate pretest probability of disease. Um, and so very often, I mean, if you're evaluating literature, um, you know, tests, uh, you know, that are, uh, are most useful are ones where they really focus on the intermediate probability of disease. And I'll show you the reason why in just a moment. So shown here is another, consider this as another example. We have a pretest probability of um, 2%. Once again, you have a likelihood ratio of your test of 20%, but you'll note that um, the probability of uh, having the disease, the post-test probability, is only 30%, so it's really, it really doesn't help one as much as we did in the case where there's intermediate probability. And the flip side, imagine a case where we have a 95% pretest probability, a, likely, a like, likelihood ratio of 0.2, once again, we have the same post-test probability of 30%. And so I actually use the same likelihood ratios here as I did in the prior example, but you'll notice that the post-test probabilities are much more intermediate with regards to the prior study, you know, um, and the main, the difference between the two was the pretest probability. So, you know, just uh, one, you know, one thing you consider when evaluating research is that they're actually applying their test in an appropriate way to an appropriate population. And like I said, in many cases, those tests are most useful when applied to cases of intermediate probability. And so, you know, diagnostic testing, um, the, uh, I'll just uh, give you a more specific example of VQ studies here. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll consider a VQ scan. And so um, the way VQ scans are categorized actually differs a little bit depending on when it's planar versus um, SPECT imaging. And we'll be going over those two uh, different uh, uh, ways of, uh, of um, studies in just a moment. So based on the clinical symptoms, and signs, uh, and also some other diagnostic testing, such as D-dimer, we can risk stratify patients for the probability of pulmonary embolism, which would give us a pretest probability. The VQ test you know, can be used to better stratify patients, and based on which can be, this can be actually be considered as your likely, you know, you can obtain a likelihood ratio from the VQ test, depending on the results of the VQ test, and then compute a post-test probability of pulmonary embolism. Now, shown here is a table of how your pretest probability 
shown on the horizontal axis and post-test probability shown on the vertical axis will give, um, I'm sorry, and you're like, you know, you have probability of the test equivalent to like, you know, which would be equivalent to like the likelihood ratio, although not exactly the same thing here. Um, will give you a post-test probability shown in the black squares of this example. And you will note that the, for a very low uh, pre-test probability, you know, even for a fairly high post-test probability, for a pre-test probabil probability of, um, basically 20% and a probability of, of, of you know, the VQ test uh, is 0.8. We have a post-test probability of only about 60%. And on the flip side, for very high pre-test probability, even a fairly low, um, you know, low score on the VQ test, you'll only have a very intermediate um, post-test probability using the VQ scan. Whereas if you have a, um, intermediate pretest probability, you'll notice that the low probability or high probability VQ scan do quite a bit to be able to better risk stratify your, your patients into those having or not having pulmonary embolism. Now, this is for planar image. This data is given for planar imaging here. It changes a little bit when done for SPECT, which uses a bit more of a binary classifier rather than, you know, the high, intermediate, low, very low, normal probability scans used for planar imaging. But the overall trend you'll see here is very similar. For a positive VQ scan here, okay, um, or you'll note actually for more intermediate post pretest probability shown here, 30%, you get a very wide separation uh, between your positive and negative scans. And as you go to very high pretest probabilities or very low pretest probabilities, VQ scan is, has less of an ability to risk stratify your high and low risk groups. So now we're going to talk a little bit about probability distributions. When we talk about probability distributions, um, basically it just gives you the probability of obtaining a certain value obtained from at random from a certain uh, process. And very often when we talk about probability distributions, um, we're making certain assumptions. So um, shown on the uh, upper left-hand corner is basically a normal probability distribution with, let's say, mean zero and variance one. Now, these distributions have different characteristics. The uh, distribution on the upper right corner um, has a same mean, but a variance of greater than one. The lower left, uh, uh, same variance, but different mean. And in the lower right corner, you'll notice it has a non-normal distribution. Um, now, there uh, are many different distributions, and it's important to kind of not necessarily remember the distributions themselves, but remember that like different physical processes have dis different distributions. And that sometimes, though not always, it's important to know exact, it's helpful to know what the distribution is, you know, to be able to conduct your statistical testing, um, or at least, you know, know what the data looks like. And one of the more common distributions often used is the Gaussian distribution. And I'm going to use this as an example when talking about some of your defined statistical distributions in general. Now, a normal distribution um, is a, when they say a, these are often referred to as parametric um, distributions. And parametric statistics often refer to these parametric distributions. And they're called parametric because your statistics takes a known statistical form. In this case, in the upper left-hand corner, we have the probability of an event occurring is equal to, and it's some mathematical function. The exact form of the function not, is not important, but note that it's a, dependent on two parameters, mu, the mean, and sigma, the standard deviation. And these two parameters um, define, you know, once we actually know what, uh, you know, uh, statistical function we're, we're considering here, the uh, distribution, the Gaussian distribution, these will basically define the Gaussian distribution. Those are the parameters used to define the distribution. And that, this would be an example of, uh, of a, a parametric uh, distribution. And so based on the knowledge of these distributions, we can um, estimate the probability of observing a value or range of values. Um, and so for example here, um, let's say we want to consider the uh, probability of obtaining uh, are results greater than or equal to x. Well, if we know the distribution, okay, all we have to do is add the area under the, um, the curve that's greater than the observed value here, x, and compare that with the area under the curve to the uh, left side of x. And that will basically give us a probability of obtaining a value of x or greater. Now, this um, works if, if the uh, process that we're 
examining follows this particular distribution. Um, and so it's very important when analyzing data to make sure that the data that you're analyzing can accurately be modeled by the proposed distribution. Um, and graphical displays of data can be useful to help confirm that uh, this is in fact the case. So shown here is an example, and I've seen this happen before uh, when evaluating um, papers in the, in the, uh, in the literature um, as, as a reviewer and also when examining my own data. So if one collected a data set, and um, you know, very often people will use t-test or whatnot to evaluate their data, you make certain assumptions of your data. And in this case right here, this would correspond to a binormal uh, distribution of uh, the data set. This would be very important to know prior to doing a statistical test on the data because you'd want to make sure that these statistical tools that you're using are appropriate to a bimodal data distribution. And so now we're going to be talking about um, statistics. Um, any questions about probability briefly before we go on? So I think we'll be addressing some of the reasons why we were having the discussion of probability distributions momentarily. So statistics is the flip side of probability. Before we were talking about these known statistical distributions where you could estimate the probability of an event occurring. In statistics, what you're really kind of assuming is that you don't know what the underlying probability laws are, but you're trying to figure them out. So you're using your data to try to figure out exactly what the underlying physical principles governing your data are so that you can model it and make predictions. Okay, And uh, it, it uses um, mathematical theories of probability to be able to determine what those underlying um, uh, rules are. Um, and so basically, um, statistics uh, can be used uh, some are, and there are many ways statistics can be used. Um, it can be used as a way of summarizing a data set, making inferential statements. It can be used to highlight important aspects of a data, data set. I'm sure many of you have read about or heard about big data and uh, you know that we are acquiring uh, so much data right now in many different ways, medically and non-medically. It can be difficult to make sense of the data at times and statistics can actually be thought of as a way of summarizing that data into a more, uh, more, more um, uh, a smaller data set uh, that's easier for a human being to comprehend because sometimes many large data sets are beyond the abilities of most human beings to really wrap their brain around. Now it's important to know that the incorrect application of statistics can be confusing at best and misleading at worst. And I'm sure many of you have heard there's a saying, well, there are three types of lies, damn lies, damn lies, and statistics. And I think that's rather unfair. Uh, statistics really don't lie, but they can be very misleading if applied incorrectly. Um, and so we'll be talking about that in a bit. And an understanding of how probabilistic theory relates to statistics is very important um, when um, uh, considering uh, how to best apply uh, statistics. So, so the selection of a statistical test um, for representing data should be based on the nature of the underlying process and observations. Um, and the statistic which best kind of models the data should be the one that's used to represent the data. So imagine here uh, one is doing um, a study on uh, trying to differentiate uh, lymph nodes involving cancer and those not involving cancer. Um, so if you look, let's assume that these are the distributions of lymph nodes uh, found experimentally. Um, you'll note that, well, the variances of these two lymph node groups are abruptly equal by I. Um, we would have to test that to be certain. However, the means vary. So in this particular instance, if one were interested in looking at the difference between these two lymph node groups, looking at a difference in means would be probably be, or medians, modes, what have you, different measures of a central tendency, would probably be a better study than variance, for example. Now this is fairly straightforward, but it just highlights the point that really understanding and knowing what your data looks like is important when considering the best statistical test to apply to your data set. Now, there are several different, uh, there are two main ways in which one can think about statistics. I, I kind of like to think of statistics as being both uh, qualitative and quantitative. Now, for qualitative statistics, um, these can provide a, uh, a summary of uh, measures of the data um, and provide greater clarity into the data set as a whole. Um, this can be both uh, uh, numerical methods, such as the mean, median, and mode, as well as graphical displays of data. 
and in a quantitative sense where you're kind of making some assumptions on the underlying physical principles on governing the data and you can make uh, inferential statements regarding whether or not the data and theory agree. And once again, that you can actually use your qualitative methods to kind of generate hypothesis which you can test quantitatively. Now shown here is just a brief example. Let's say you've got two data sets here and you're, uh, you know, so you, you want to evaluate what these data sets look like. This here is a frequency uh, polygon. So you can actually see here that your data, um, you've got two sets of data shown by yellow and green curves. You'll note that your yellow data set and green data set appear roughly normally distributed. You can't say that definitively without conducting a statistical test, but you can say that they appear to be uh, symmetric and uh, roughly unimodal, although there's a good bit of noise involved in these, uh, in these two data sets. Now, uh, I think when, when first looking at your data, uh, I think it's very important to do a qualitative analysis. I personally like to do a graphical analysis of data, and this can be done in a few ways, using histograms, uh, and, and so there are many, many ways of looking at data, okay? I'm just going to show them what I'm presenting today is a sweeping overview of some statistical ways of analyzing data and understanding statistics, and so these are some very, very simple, easy to apply ways of analyzing data. Um, and I, the ones I always start with my go-to when I'm first analyzing a data set are to use, um, I personally like frequency polygons, although many people use histograms and scatter plots. Um, so basically, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So uh, it's a histogram that basically has a bar representing the number of occurrences of an observation falling in a certain range. Uh, I'm a little bit more partial to the frequency polygon. So this is the, actually the same data set shown here, but instead of having a bar, it shows a dot representing the center point of these, um, a dot for the center parts of these bars connected by a straight line. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are some textbooks I've read that said this overall gives a better, more smooth representation of the data when compared to a histogram, which has those rough box-like edges. This gives a smoother estimation and is thought to often correlate better with the true distribution of a data set, and I personally think is much more aesthetically pleasing and easier to look at. Um, and so another method uh, that's very straightforward is a scatter plot. Um, this is in some ways analogous to a uh, frequency polygon. Um, where it shows the distribution of data as a function of a variable, but in this case, this can be used for a two-dimensional data set, whereas a frequency polygon or histogram are used for one-dimensional data sets. Um, and so why are these helpful? Well, they're really helpful. Let's say that you know, you're, 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 you're looking at a new, um, um, new uh, radiology test, and you want to see you know, how, it kind of like, how it does to evaluate a certain disease. Well, you might have a few different ways you could apply this um, test. You know, let's say that you're looking at SUV measurements for a, um, for a PET study, um, and you're not certain, do I want to look at the mean, the median, the mode, the maximum, what have you? Well, a, a graphical representation of these statistics can be very useful to give you a sense of, wow, you know, I actually see better separation of data, you know, using this particular metric of, be it the mean, median, mode, maximum, as opposed to the others. And that you can get a very, quick intuitive idea of when um, using graphical methods. It's also helpful to uh, determine the nature of the data. Um, and uh, it may be useful to determine if the data is amenable to uh, the proposed method of analysis and refine the methods of analysis used when analyzing the data. So shown here um, uh, is, uh, let's say that one's um, interested in looking at for a certain disease um, and you're looking at the diameters of uh, a lymph node in this particular disease and you want to compare them with a normal population. Um, so let, let's say you want to use a t-test to compare this with a normal, uh, that mean here with a, uh, the means from a normal population. Can anyone maybe a, a chat in and text why it might be a problem to use a t-test on the, this data set? interactive component here over the internet, if anyone uh, would care to text in or chat in the uh, potential reason. Okay, so uh, no takers. So um, I have, uh, may not have noticed that this is actually not a, uh, um, the t one of the implicit assumptions made in the uh, t-test is that your data is, uh, or your residuals from your data are normally distributed, uh, which in normal distribution implies unimodal. Um, and as you look here, this is not a unimodal distribution. This data set, in fact, looks bimodal. 
So, and I know I, when I've been reviewing papers, um, I've seen cases where, you know, people have applied a t-test to a data set. And when you actually look at their histogram or frequency polygon, you'll note that their data is bimodally distributed. So in that instance, uh, a t-test and many of your other both parametric and non-parametric statistics would not, I repeat, not be amenable for analysis of that data set. Um, and if one were to actually t look into this data further, it may well be, so I actually, this is data I simulated, and I actually simulated data as coming from populations with two different means. It may well be that you actually have two different subgroups of a disease that you're evaluating. And once you correct for those two subgroups, your data may be unimodal, and you actually just gain some really useful um, information regarding the disease. Not only may it differ from normal, um, but that there are two variants of a disease which may in fact differ from each other um, based on lymph node size. And, and then secondly, that um, using a data, using a statistic that assumes a unimodal distribution would not be applicable in this instance, okay? And so um, uh, I really feel that, you know, when a, a graphical representation of one's data set um, before starting statistical analysis is very helpful to make sure um, that your data set actually will follow the rules it's supposed to in applying the proposed statistical methods you intend to apply. And it may also be useful for gleaning additional information from the data that you were not expecting, such that this data set is unimodal, is, bimo is bimodal. And there may be, in fact, two uh, distinct subgroups in the data set that you thought was uh, actually one group. Now, quantitative statistics um, are used to, and, uh, to test uh, whether a distribution uh, comes of whether the data um, uh, uh, make inferential statements from the data and test whether or not it comes from a distribution with defined properties. And you can estimate the significance of a result. So shown here is our prior example. Uh, where we had a frequency polygon, and uh, note this is a qualitative evaluation, but a quantitative metric of that uh, may be the mean, the median, or the mode. Um, which of those three that's used may depend on a few factors, um, but each of those three would be useful for making quantitative statements regarding the data. Now, um, once these parameters are defined, we often obtain these because we're interested in evaluating, well, I, let's say, think that in um, a certain disease, as we had before, that I think that the lymph node size should be larger than in normal cases by this amount. So you've made a certain assumption on what you think the underlying probabilistic laws governing that process are, that you think that in a disease it has, you know, a lymph node diameter greater uh, than two, let's say, centimeter short axis. Now, if you want to compare that with theory, how can you determine whether or not, you know, that what you're saying is in fact true, the significance of your statistic relative to probability? Well, there are two ways of approaching that. One is to use what are called parametric statistics. This is a branch of statistics where you assume the data comes from a probability a population that follows a very specific uh, probability distribution based on a fixed set of parameters. Um, and so, uh, some examples of parametric statistics would include, but are not limited to, the student's t-test, analysis of variance, and linear regression analysis. Now, um, when uh, one does this, when one says parametric distribution, that would be a distribution such as the normal distribution, where you have a, you know, a, set, a certain shape with a mean and variance, um, a uniformly distributed distribution where you know the, in, in, um, the values are uniformly distributed, or other parametric distributions, the, the Gaussian being the most common. This contrasts with the non-parametric uh, statistics, where your statistics are based on, uh, uh, not based on a parametric family of distributions. Um, and this is a, a, a definition given online, which I don't entirely like, but I will describe why in a minute. And it says it does not make assumptions regarding the probability distribution of the variables being assessed. Well, that's not entirely true. You are making some assumptions, but you're not saying that, you know, our distribution can be modeled by a Gaussian distribution with mean mu and variance sigma or another well-defined parametric distribution. They will make assumptions. Um, for example, many non-parametric data sets will say, will assume that the data is uh, symmetrically distributed about a certain mean. Um, and so you're not assuming you know what the mean is or what the variance is or what the shape of that distribution is, but you are making the assumption that it is symmetrically distributed about a mean. So that is important. It, 
they don't make zero assumptions, but they don't assume that uh, non-parametric uh, statistics do not assume, once again, that you have a, param you know, a very well-defined parametric model for your data. For that reason, they are more flexible. So this would be an example of a normal distribution where you have a parameter mu uh, variant sigma, and based on those two, you've exactly defined what the distribution of your data is. So parametric, uh, non-parametric methods do not make this assumption. They would merely say that you're uniformly distributed about a certain mean. Now, some very straightforward, I think, non-parametric statistics would include your Wilcoxon uh, tests. Now, note that for many non-parametric methods, they have several names. It's actually very confusing <laughs> if you're to look this up. So the Wilcoxon sign rank test and rank sum test have many other different names, but you know you can look online, just do a good search for these online, and you'll see you know what these tests are, how they're applied, and some of the different names given to them. But just, I think, an intuitive understanding of what these tests are and how they're applied, or that your Wilcoxon tests are similar in many regards to your t-test, um, that is, they test for the central tendency of a data, but do not make the assumption that your data is normally distributed, um, and they are used in different instances, be it the um, set for one data set or paired data, as is in the rank sign rank test, or for pooled data where you have, you know, two different data sets with different uh, potential means, uh, which we use your rank sum test. And um, one um, uh, statistical method I'm a very big fan of, um, which I will not be going into into too much detail, are our resampling techniques, in particular the bootstrap. Um, you, you know, it's a little more on the complex side if you were going to apply it, but the methods like the bootstrap can be applied really to, to virtually any data set, assuming that it's of a certain size. Um, you're really not making any assumptions regarding your data. Other, The only assumption really that resampling methods like the bootstrap make is that your sample is representative of the population you're evaluating. And if that's not true, you're sunk no matter which statistic you use. Um, but if that um, <laughs> fairly minor constraint is met, uh, resampling techniques such as the bootstrap can be very helpful. Um, and so that really kind of helps us to the point where we can have a little bit of understanding of what a p-value is. So p-values are basically the probability that a value drawn from the proposed distribution is the same or further than the expected um, value uh, than the observed value. Um, and so once again, we'll go back to our lymph node example here. So let's say um, that we have a normal distribution for lymph nodes. Um, and that's, I normalized to a zero mean, so we subtracted the mean because you'd never have a lymph node with a diameter of less than zero. Um, and we want to say, well, gosh, you know, this is what a normal distribution of lymph nodes looks like. And let's say we have a lymph node that measures, you know, at X, which is about 1.5 after it's been adjusted. Um, what's the probability of having this, getting this result or greater? from uh, our, you know, our normal lymph nodes. So what one does is you add the, uh, look at the area of the curve at the value of X and more extreme, greater, you know, you add all that area up or integrate it, and you compare that with the area of the, of the curve uh, lower than X, and that will give you the probability of uh, a lymph node with this distribution uh, of, this val of this size coming from this distribution. Now, this is why it's critically important to be able to have uh, an accurate knowledge of what your data looks like before applying a p-value, and why I discussed parametric and non-parametric distributions before. Because if you applied you know, a p-value such as this, um, uh, computed this in this manner for that um, uh, binorm or that uh, bimodal distribution, obviously this would not be an appropriate test to use. So um, computing p-values, you really are assuming that you know what your distribution looks like and that it follows the distribution that you propose. Um, and so this test would only be really considered valid if your lymph node distributions actually follow a normal distribution, which can be reduced to mean zero and variance one after normalization. Uh, and one other thing to note that I think is very important um, that I know sometimes some folks have a little bit of a hard time um, grasping is that when you're computing probabilities using, you know, the methods that would, you know, I'd call be like, you know, uh, frequentist statistics uh, here, um, that you really can't, the probability of a single event occurring, let's say the probability of X being exactly equal to 1.5, it really is zero, because that's the probability of obtaining, you know, a value between, you know, like of obtaining a value of 1.50000 is going off to infinity. So in considering, you know, the probability of events occurring, you really need to consider a range. Uh, so that, you know, the, the, if you add like, you know, an infinitely, you know, small slice under the curve, the 
value will be zero. So you have to look at the probability of an event occurring between, let's say, X and Y, or in this case, where the observed value is X and the extreme value is infinity, if that makes any sense at all. So when you're actually looking to test um, probabilities and compute p-values, you have to consider a range of probabilities. And what's typically done is that you're assuming that you're, the value you will observe is equal to or greater than the observed value. And that's the way it's typically phrased when, uh, when doing research. And so con consequently, when performing your own research, it's very important to make sure that you know, your, your data conforms to what you think it should. Um, and also in critically evaluating research, make sure that their data actually follows the distribution they say it is when they're using, let's say, a t-test to compute p-values. Um, and so uh, the lower the p-value, the less likely the observed statistic can be planned under the null hypothesis. Um, so just to show an example here, let's say we're going to go back to our infamous example of the fair coin. Um, you flip a coin 100 times. Uh, what's the probability of getting 60 ahead 60 times? And is the coin fair? So um, just everyone just think, what do you think? I'm just, just for fun, you know, just think, well, do you think it's like 50%, like 50%, 60% probability that, you know, you'll get coin 60 times, and it turns out that actually the p-value of this would be like about 1% uh, of getting uh, a total of um, 60 heads when flipping a coin 50 times. So what basically I did here is, you know, if you flip the coin, uh, this is the pro you know, you can actually sit down and quantitatively determine what the probability of flipping a coin, you know, uh, 100 times and getting 60 heads would be, since we know the underlying probabilistic laws governing the toss of a fair coin. And so Shown here on the uh, x-axis are the um, number of times you would receive heads you know, after flipping a coin um, 100 times. And on the y-axis would be the probability of, uh, of those occurrences. And you'll note that if you look at the area of, um, so the p-value here of obtaining, uh, of getting 60, one would look at the area under the curve of uh, greater, you know, 60 or greater. So that would be the, what would the, you're asking, what is the probability if, you know, this is a fair coin of receiving, uh, 60 heads or greater, and the probability here would be the area of the curve under, you know, uh, the um, greater than 60 uh, divided by the area of the curve under 60, and in this case, uh, compared to the area of the curve under 60, which in this case would be 0 0.0176. Um, and by convention, um, when looking at statistical significance, um, values of less than or equal to 0 0.05 are considered statistically significant. Now, this is um, convention, uh, and it's not, you know, written in stone anywhere that this is the value one must use. In fact, I would argue there are times when this value it definitely should not be used, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, and note that other thresholds can be used, but this is just the one that by convention is often taken to be considered statistically significant. Um, so when we're talking about um, a p-value, um, there, there are several different ways one can think about this. So you have your test statistic value, okay? Transforming that, you know, when you consider the distribution it came from, you can estimate what the p-value is. And then depending on what the p-value is, you have to decide whether or not you think it's significant. Well, the threshold that we use is often called the type 1 error threshold um, and is basically uh, deno so often denoted by the Greek letter alpha and is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis based on the results of a test if the null hypothesis is true. So going back to this um, example here, so let's say we really have a coin that's fair uh, and we flip it, uh, you know, 100 times and we get a value of 60. Well, what's the probability, you know, of getting this result of 60 assuming that it's a fair coin and we can show what that is here. Now, you'll note that you can toss a fair coin 100 times and have a value that's greater than that, but, you know, this is the probability of that event occurring assuming the null hypothesis is true, okay? And so um, uh, the reason I bring up the whole point of the, the p-value of the significance level or type 1 error of 0 0.05 is because there are times you do not want to use that. And I will, uh, the times you would want to consider revising that are when you're considering multiple comparisons. And this is a place where I find um, uh, people doing research and publishing research, I think often, I think could do things better. Um, so um, the p-value is the probability of a value of, uh, you know, at least as extreme as the observed value for a single, you know, all caps, single, very important test. Um, but what happens if there are multiple tests? How would this affect um, the decision to apply um, a type one error value of 0.05 um, or another value? So 
consider that we're looking of a set of antihypertensive medications on blood pressure. Uh, and we're looking at, you know, the how the, the blood, uh, you know, paired difference here. We're looking at blood pressures before and after administering this medication. And we want to consider uh, giving using a uh, significance uh, type 1 error level of 0 0.05. And uh, let's say that we, uh, which is a 1 in 20 probability of having any one of, uh, you know, these tests, uh, this test be positive if the null hypothesis is true. So let's say we're looking at 20 medications, okay? We would expect at least one of these to have um, a p-value of 0 0.5 or lower, 0 0.5 or lower, just based on chance alone. So what I did here was I uh, generated uh, 20 normally normal distributions of mean zero. I'm sorry, mean uh, mean zero variance uh, standard deviation one. And um, if you consider, look at the uh, the mean, the t-value, and the p-value. Um, if one were to have, let's say, 20 different medications here where there was absolutely no treatment effect, okay? Um, there was zero treatment effect. By chance alone, in this particular case that I simulated, you'll note that two of these results were statistically significant, okay? Now, this is a problem, um, and this is a problem where I find in the literature you'll find is often not taken into account. You'll find I've seen many studies performed and pu published um, where the individuals will look at multiple different, um, you know, different statistics, different medications. Uh, that's a good thing to look at many different, you know, uh, statistics and medications and whatnot. But you have to take multiple comparisons into account because here by chance alone, two of the um, examples we have out of 20 reach statistical significance based on chance alone, even though I can tell you based on, you know, the fact that I generated these distributions, I simulated this, you know, from distributions where there was no difference by chance alone, they're statistically significant. Well, how does one correct for this both when doing one's own research and how can you take this into consideration when critically evaluating research in the literature? Well, um, there is are ways to correct for multiple comparisons. There are several ways. Um, they're dependent on your knowledge of the correlation between variables. And in fact, there are some implicit ways in which a statistical test can take this into account. I know I've seen cases where uh, very often when comparing many groups, individuals may look at applying several different repeated t-tests to, you know, variables and multiple combinations when in fact they could just do an analysis of variance, which would basically take all those comparisons into account, intrinsic within the framework of the test, or maybe doing a linear regression instead of doing several t-tests. Um, those are all ways in which just selecting the appropriate statistic kind of takes that into account implicitly without having to explicitly you know, consider it. Um, however, um, there are other ways uh, when that's not possible. A method I'm very, very, um, uh, uh, I really enjoy applying and I think it's very important is the Bonferroni correction. It's a very conservative method. Um, that is, it's really maybe likely to underestimate the significance of your data, but you will not overestimate it. So this is a method that should, you know, can be used and no one should have problems with when you're trying to publish your data. Um, basically what you do, as I said, like if you do a test 20 times just out of chance alone, you'd expect, you know, the p-value of 0 0.05 to be exceeded once, even if the null hypothesis is true. Basically what you do is you divide your threshold by the number of comparisons. Um, and so uh, if the typical type 1 error is 0 0.05, your revised type 1 error when conducting 20 studies would be um, 0 0.05 divided by 20, which would give you 0 0.0025. So this would be the probability um, of any one of your tests in this entire group rejecting the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is true. Does that, I, I hope that makes sense for everybody. Um, so basically, um, when selecting this new uh, significance threshold, you'll note that um, for the same uh, normally distributed uh, uh, randomly distributed uh, normal distributions I generated before, none of the p-values are statistically significant anymore using this new threshold, which is what you would expect given the null hypothesis or would hope for given the null hypothesis is true. <laughs> you come a little close in a few cases, but that's fine. You know, these are the results you would want and expect. And so um, I really feel very strongly that this is a big place where I, you know, people, you know, often you see a lot of studies, they don't do statistics exactly as you kind of hope they would, but this is a big place where I see uh, a number of published studies really don't, you know, do their statistics correctly um, and I think could be improved on. 
using a multiple comparisons test. Now, this the nice thing about the Bonferroni correction, one of the things I really like about it, is that you can actually apply this to publish data sets if there are a few conditions are met. So basically, if you have a uh, study that actually says, you know, our p-value is x, our p-value is y, and actually explicitly gives a number, you can actually apply a different type 1 level error threshold yourself. So if they, let's say they say the p-value for this study is 0 0.0, 0.03. Um, if they did 10 comparisons, all you would need to do is divide whatever p of whatever um, type 1 error you would like by the number of comparisons and get a revised threshold. So in this case, if they did 10 comparisons, uh, you would divide 0 0.05 by 10, and this would give you your revised type 1 error that you would use as a threshold for significance. And so if they state what their p-values are explicitly, then you can actually say, well, yeah, you know, using this Bonferroni correction, you know, none of their results actually are statistically significant, or, well, this one actually is, but the rest are not. So this, uh, you can do this as long as they state what their thresholds are. Um, many published works will only say that our statistical significance, our p-value is less than 0 0.05. If that happens, you're kind of stuck. You really, you, you can't do that. The only place you could be is like if they have different categories, like they say, you know, our, our significance was less than 0 0.01, or 0 0.001, you know, then at least you can get kind of windows and you can kind of do some level of refining uh, using the Bonferroni correction, but this really works best if they actually publish what their actual p-values are. And then you can do your own, uh, own multiple comparisons correction. So, um, uh, so this kind of leads us to the notion of diagnostic testing. Um, and so uh, diagnostic testing is used to answer specific medical questions. Um, and often, is, as I mentioned before, useful when uh, there's concern for a disease. And when considering um, this, uh, this uh, diagnostic test, I'm sure you guys, many of you have seen this before, it's called a confusion table, very appropriately named given it tends to confuse a lot of people. Um, but it's really not that complicated. All you have is that on your horizontal axis, you have your uh, predicted uh, test values, uh, the, the whether or not the um, test is uh, true or positive, and on the uh, uh, vertical axis, whether or not there's actually a, tr a true or positive. And based on this table, one can compute any metrics such as sensitivity, specificity, uh, your positive and uh, negative predictive values. Uh, and I, I really don't even know if it's necessary for any, anyone to remember these values here, other than to, uh, as long as you can find them rapidly when you need them. I mean, these are available online. A few things that I do think are very important, though, um, and uh, so this is just some ways of considering, uh, intuitively understanding what these terms mean. That these sensitivities are probably of a test positive case being marked positive, the specificity are probably of negative case being marked negative, and the positive and negative predictive values are the probability of a positive and negative test being positive and negative respectively. Now, I think the real of uh, just intuitively understanding this, I think, is very important. And you know, when you need to calculate these values, you can look them up. Um, they're readily available online. Um, and so. Uh, very important, I think, is just to note that the sensitivity and specificity are not affected by prevalence, and that but the positive and negative predictive values are. For this reason, uh, when uh, many published data sets will often talk about the sensitivity and specificity because they're not dependent on disease prevalence, so they're independent of prevalence, and that's very important when looking at published data and conducting your own. Now, it could be that in some cases, the positive and negative predictive value are important to also report and consider but when that happens, you really need to carefully consider what the population of interest is, and you need to know what the prevalence of disease is. So they're very, also very important metrics, but you have to, you have to, there's, you need to know a little bit more of the story before you can use those metrics uh, confidently. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so um, very often, um, yeah, a test will not be sensitive and specific, but one can have uh, a sensitive test complementing a specific test. Uh, such that uh, together those two tests can be very useful. And very often a sensitive test is used for um, screening, but a specific test is used for confirming a diagnosis. Um, and so uh, so this is actually uh, some other information here that I will just kind of go through, uh, kind of don't have time to go over in, uh, in very uh, great detail, but will be available. I think I'll be posting this uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, PDF for this online for ROC analysis and basically how the ROC analysis uses the components of confusion matrix
and uh, the uh, positive predictive values and uh, true and the false positive fractions and the confidence levels for an observer's uh, decisions to be able to uh, rank an observer and or diagnostic test where a perfect observer it will have basically the area under the curve here uh, it would, uh, they'll have complete accuracy without any false positive fractions uh, at random uh, chance just guessing uh, the uh, you know basically it's a line uh, through the middle of the square and you'll note that the uh, area under the curve can be used as a metric uh, when comparing different um, different ROC curves um, in general the higher the area under the curve the better the test um, a variant of the ROC curve is the LROC curve. The ROC curve does not take localization into account. There you're merely stating whether or not the, uh, there's an abnormality or not in the data set. The LROC curve is a bit more generalized. And here you're saying not only, first they'd say whether or not they think the case is abnormal and do they lose their confidence, but also do they localize property? Because maybe they, they don't click on localize the mass, but they localize on a cluster chondral lesion and they're right about the case for the long re different wrong reason. So this actually will allow one to be able to core take localization into account and is a method I personally use in my research and I think is very important when considering observer behavior because especially in radiology, location matters. It really does. Interesting to note that since localization uh, may not be uh, perfect, um, that unlike the ROC curve, your uh, uh, curve does not intersect with one and one uh, at the extreme right, upper right corner. It can be less than one year area. Um, uh, you know, the uh, maximum LROC on the uh, vertical axis may be less than one. Your FROC is similar to the LROC. The LROC, you can use localization, but you only have one target per image. Uh, makes the statistics a lot easier. Uh, FROC analysis, you may have multiple targets. The statistics here gets a lot harder. I think LROC, uh, LROC analysis, the, uh, analysis is very similar to ROC analysis. It's really not that complicated once you start doing FROC. Like if you have multiple, um, you know, target lesions as here, um, you once again may uh, your intersection of your uh, LROC curve uh, will not be one on the vertical axis, and um, more complicated methods of uh, statistical analysis are needed. This is where it starts getting a little bit harder, um, and you start needing to use things like the jackknife, the bootstrap. I personally use the bootstrap when I start doing some of these methods. But they're but they're they're more complicated, and when you start using these uh, these non-parametric resampling techniques, it takes more data to show statistical significance. And so, um, uh, just one brief uh, note on that. Uh, we're getting close to wrapping up here. When you're trying to determine statistical significance, the more assumptions you make about your data, the stronger your test will be. But you're very dependent on those assumptions. So if you can accurately implement a t-test. You will have, you know, some of the best ability to separate two data sets if you compare that with a Wilcoxon non-parametric test, and the Wilcoxon test will be stronger than, let's say, a bootstrap or sampling method. Um, boot the, the, more generally, you know, their bootstrap and uh, uh, non-parametric tests are more generally applicable, but they will be having a more difficult time separating, you know, data sets that are, you know, not as widely separated just because that's the nature of the test. So using a resampling technique like this, you'll need a larger data set to have the same level of significance, just the nature of the beast. So briefly before I finish up, I'll talk a little bit about some of the software that you can use. <clears throat> um, there are many software tools out there for statistical analysis. <clears throat> um, I will not go over all of them. I'll just go over the ones with which I am familiar. Um, and I'm not making any recommendations necessarily. Um, Excel can actually do a lot. Um, it's kind of hidden a little bit, but if you look it up online, Excel can do a lot of the things you may need to do. May not necessarily do them quickly or very, you know, reproducibly. That is, you, you really can't automate things well in Excel, but if you don't do a lot of statistics and you have one or two data sets you need to analyze, I think it actually works really well. Um, uh, another method is uh, MATLAB. Uh, I actually use MATLAB myself. It's an engineering and science uh, programming language. Um, so it's actually a full programming language with a statistics toolbox. This is great if you have a lot of data you need to analyze, do some exploratory analysis, or want to kind of automate your data analyses. Uh, so you can actually code and write your programs to be able to analyze your data. Um, very, actually very nicely documented language. Uh, the, all the toolboxes are very well documented. There are a lot of tools out there. The caveat on this, and I'd say the whole major drawback would be that it's uh, proprietary, and it's actually fairly expensive if your institution does not have an institutional license. 
And even if they do, I know I've had problems where collaborators of mine have not had access to MATLAB, which can be challenging. Um, those are more your general tools you can use. Um, more, some more specific uh, statistical and numerical analysis languages you can use. Their specific statistics are uh, SPSS, SAS, and S. These are all proprietary uh, statistical analysis packages. Um, we, you know, they, they cost money. R is basically a variant, a very similar to S, but is free. I have used R before, um, and, but I just uh, don't use it as often. I've, just used, I've used MATLAB, but R is also very useful for people who are looking to do statistics. Um, it's free, and I know a lot of people use R for their programming, and it's actually similar to some of the other languages I've got mentioned here. If you're looking to get started up, and it's actually, I believe, certain a lot of the, um, the way they structure their data and the way they input and output data are similar, and I think are somewhat cross-compatible with the other languages here. Um, and I will just throw, throw this out here, some general programming languages, if anyone out there programs. Um, uh, there are many out there. Um, these are two of the ones that I think a lot of people in, in the sciences and in academics tend to use. I personally program in Python. Uh, it's one of, I think, probably the most common programming languages used in academics. And actually, it's a, considered one of the easier languages to use. Ruby is also used as well. Um, I'm not as familiar with Ruby, but it's very similar to Python. Um, they have, they're very similar in many regards. Um, they both have statistical um, toolboxes and, uh, and libraries that can compute many of the statistics we had previously. They're not quite as uh, easy to implement and user-friendly depending on the user interface you select, but they are very powerful. Like if I have to do file manipulation, data manipulation, like I have some, I want to, you know, I'm like a Python actually has some libraries where you can anonymize data sets, you know, rename files, do rewindowing, image manipulation files in an automated fashion. And it actually has, I don't know about Ruby, but I know Python actually has a library for DICOM file manipulation, which is really nice and can really can do some uh, a large scale uh, processing of DICOM data sets. Um, and so, uh, but these are more general languages that um, you can use. And uh, there are many different user interfaces that can be make them much more user friendly. So if you have any questions on how to do apply statistics when reviewing data, you can talk to friends or colleagues, uh, your mentors, like if you're working on a research project with a few people, you know, just uh, sit down and have a talk about what statistics you're going to apply and how to do it. Uh, many departments have uh, in-house departmental statistics support. Uh, for those that don't, if you have collaborators, like many other uh, non-radiology departments, such as like I know oncology, we often collaborate with, uh, we'll have in-house statistics support um, that can provide help on those questions. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and looking online can at least point you in the right direction if you have any questions on how to um, either perform your own statistics correctly or evaluation of uh, statistical methods in the literature. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, your time out there and joining us from Cyberland. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in via chat or ask those questions. I'll be delighted to do what I can do to answer them. Okay, I have not gotten any questions. Um, yet. And if there are no questions, um, I'd be del delighted to thank everyone. Oh, uh, got a question here. Uh, okay, I've got a question on thoughts on how to walk through using the statistics programs. So that's a great question. And I will say that there's so many different statistics programs out there. I think it'll be very dependent on which program you use and which ones you're comfortable with. Um, and uh, that might be a topic. Uh, Dr. Rosencrantz has been uh, one of the people who's been uh, coordinating this uh, lecture of statistical series. And I'd say that, you know, maybe send him an email if that would be a topic that would be of general interest. But uh, really, in terms of using the software, I think it's probably good to find out what your collaborators and people at your institution use um, because you know, the way in which you'll do things using different statistical packages will be different and uh, not necessarily easily translatable. Um, and so I'd say, you know, check with your institution, find out which are the tech, you know, use they have. I think Excel is pretty, um, pretty universal. And if uh, folks are interested in, a, you know, a little Excel 
uh, talk on how to use Excel for statistics. That would be something that I, you know, we could work, talk with Dr. Rosencrantz as a possibility for either uh, this or next year. Um, but I'd say for your other, uh, um, you know, methods, you'd really want to see what's used at your department and maybe go over someone who's familiar with those specific methods since there's so many of them. Okay, so um, I have uh, not uh, gotten any other questions and looks like folks are signing off. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone once again for joining. I hope that was helpful. And uh, please do, you know, uh, let the um, people at uh, AURRA and uh, Dr. Rosencrantz know if you think that either, uh, you know, whether you thought this topic was helpful and if there are any other topics that you think may be useful to know about uh, to help you in your research and evaluation of uh, research and literature. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Bye then.